So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Phil Barry, and I'm one of the founders of Ujo, which is a decentralized music platform built on Ethereum. There's actually various people involved in the project here today. Um, Simon de la Rivière did a, a talk on tokens before. Christian Lundqvist has helped out, and there's all kinds of other people here, Russell, etc. But I have a confession to make, which is that I am not a developer, I'm not a coder, I'm not an architect, I'm not a cryptographer, I'm not a technologist of any kind whatsoever. Um, so I apologize for what I appreciate is a fundamental failing on my part in attending this conference as a non-tech. Non but my background is in the music industry. Um, and I started out in music almost exactly 10 years ago, um, working in record companies. Um, I then embarked on a career as a, as a musician um, and ultimately set up my own independent record company. And after eight years on the creative side of the music business, um, I kind of achieved lots of things that I dreamt of doing when I was growing up. You know, I performed on TV, I'd played all the major festivals, I'd played in 13 countries, and I make almost zero money doing this. Um, and so I came to kind of two realizations. The first one was probably I was slightly deficient on the talent front. And the second one was, you know, something was up with the music industry. And so for the last couple of years, um, I've really been focused on working out what exactly it is that's up with the music industry and trying to come up with some solutions. Last year, I was um, involved in a project working with Radiohead and Tom York. Um, I spent several months working on a record that he released through BitTorrent on that project. Um, and then I eventually heard about blockchain and went through the process of, you know, heavenly angel singing that all of us have had. And then, um, you know, here I am. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning, because to understand the problems that face the music industry today, you kind of have to understand that what was going on at the beginning of the 20th century when this was the height of technology. Because the core institutions that form the basis of the music industry's infrastructure, like PRS and ASCAP, actually were born around the same time that this ship, the Titanic, was sinking on its maiden voyage in the ocean. And so that tells you almost everything you need to know. You know, this was a world before globalization, before digital, and institutions and systems that were created before you could talk to somebody on this other side of the Atlantic by the telephone are now being asked to handle a hyper-connected digital global marketplace with billions of transactions and where payments are not dollars but microcents. Or in summary, if someone says to you music rights, you just have to think sinking ship. So if we took, dig into this globalization point, you know, if you think about the world of the Titanic, it took weeks or months to travel from one continent to another. And so people generally traded in their own continents, their own local markets. And the people that sent ships across the oceans in these times intermediated between these different markets, and they did very well out of it. Well, today I can upload my video to YouTube, and before breakfast it can be watched in 50 countries. But actually, the systems, the processes, the structure of the music industry still looks like those 20th century shipping routes. And so here we have an example. This is what happens if, you're an, if you are an American songwriter, down the bottom here, whose song is played on the radio in a country somewhere else, so perhaps Japan. And this isn't even cover the recording rights or the performers or the producer, any of that. This is just the song. And it assumes one songwriter, which is very rare. But it just gives you an example of just how many intermediaries exist. At the end of the day, the songwriter is getting about half of the value of, the, 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 of their music, and it takes them up to two years to get hold of this money. And this is just absurd in the, in the new modern world. And at the same time, we have this explosion in, in digital. There's been a massive revolution in the music industry such that we're no longer selling CDs with 10 songs on them worth $20. We're now selling a single play of half of one song. And we're selling that for tiny, tiny fractions of cents. As a result, the amount of data that needs to be processed is doubling every year. There are hun literally hundreds of billions of music uses taking, taking place every year. And one single hit song, think of your, you know, your favorite Rihanna or Taylor Swift song, this, has, this kind of songs have 700,000 individual revenue streams. That's one song generating 700,000 different revenue streams. 
And so it's pretty clear that we're entering a totally new paradigm in terms of the amount of data that needs to be processed, in terms of the way that people listen to music, and in terms of the kinds of systems and processes that are going to be required in order to deal with this kind of music industry. And all of this is set against just a ridiculous background of complexity in who owns what in music. This is a piece of music called Guap by Big Sean. I've never heard it, but I'm told that it's a really strong piece of work. And it has 20, it has, you know, 20 plus people who all own some, you know, from 1.8% up to 20% of this song. And what's amazing is that there is no definitive record of this information. So every record company, every performing rights society has their own version, and they really have a hard time agreeing which version of the information is correct. And if you're an artist or a songwriter, well, the problem is if they don't agree, you don't get paid. Or maybe the wrong person gets paid and you don't get paid. OK, well, that's probably enough whining, enough complaining about the problems in music. Maybe we should start thinking about some solutions. And basically, I think blockchain, if you're in blockchain, has two main parts of the solution. First is a definitive decentralized database of music rights, of who owns what. That solves the problem on the previous page. And secondary, secondly, an automated smart contract-based licensing system. And the project that we're working on, Ujo, takes these core principles and then comes up with four basic areas of functionality. First, the decentralized database part. People publish rights information on the blockchain along with use policies for how that music can be used. So now we have a single source of information that everybody can use. Second, anybody can use the music as long as they follow the terms of those use policies. And this is actually a fundamentally different approach to licensing, which is not about control and holding on to content, but is saying, let's let content fly through the world, and people can use it freely as long as they meet the terms set by the people that created that content. And third, and at the core of the automated, automation piece, is that people get paid automatically using the smart contract when the music is used. And on the other, in the other direction, uh, uh, the, the permission to use music, the license, is also transferred by a smart contract. And finally, this is core infrastructure. So it's designed to be open and adaptable to almost any use. Anybody who can come up with a new business model, a new app, a new service for music, can plug into this and make use of the content and the flows of, the flows of licenses, et cetera, within this. So uh, last month, we released a prototype in collaboration with uh, the Grammy-winning artist Imogen Heap. Um, and this is a single song test case for what a new kind of music industry might look like if it was built on the blockchain. And as I just described, we have a set of policies attached to the song. Uh, which are the terms under which music can be used, and also the details of the share of revenue that is owned by each of the stakeholders. So each different use, a stream, a download, or a sync, might have different uh, use terms associated with it and different splits. In this case, we can see that Imogen will receive you know, 90% of a download. You know, it seems a lot, but it's fair, given that she's the songwriter, the publisher, the record label, the performer, the producer, the artist, everything else. And then um, non-featured artists will each receive in the region of 1% each. This is kind of an industry standard figure. So knowing, that, knowing this information, we can now test it out by purchasing a download. Um, here we use the Light Wallet that Christian from Consensus made. And Therefore, all I've got to do to purchase this song is enter a password. I have the Light Wallet loaded. And then the song starts downloading automatically. Uh, the Ether price is updated using an Oracle. It's made by Simon. Um, and therefore, the price in US dollars is always the same, which is attractive to an artist in the current world who um, you know, just wants to receive dollars, frankly. 
So I can then see a transparent uh, list of transactions that have all taken place. Blockchain, you can tell that I recorded this video three times because I'm the last person to make the last three transactions. Um, and this is a you know, fully transparent record of whoever's interacted with this music. And then we have under distributions, these are the outcomes of the smart contract being enacted based on the policies. So we can see that Imogen did get paid what she should have got paid. And we can see that all the, the um, non-featured artists got paid what they should have got paid. And so we see exactly where the money going. And I can follow the tread, thread transparently from start to finish, be confident that everybody is being paid what they should be in accordance with the policy and the smart contract. Uh, and this prototype is live now, ujomusic.com. So feel free to go and blow your 0.7 of an ether downloading this song. Um, and it's, you know, up there semi-permanently. So the prototype is clearly limited in scope. But the net effect of all of this is that we can create a fully automated licensing system that directly addresses the structural problems in the music industry and which we genuinely believe can wreak untold havoc on the old way of doing things. It is fundamental shared infrastructure that allows creators and their customers to do business with confidence and free of intermediaries. So perhaps we'll have time for questions in a moment, but first I just want to say something about adoption of this kind of a system. Because one of the most compelling arguments um, that people put in music against this kind of thing is that it is simply unrealistic to expect rights holders to unpick all of their hundred years of contracts and jump on board with this. And you know, when you think about this, it is actually quite a depressing thought. Um, but fortunately, when I said compelling, what I really meant was really quite flawed. And here's why. It's because today, there are 30 million songs on Spotify. But in the next decade, there are going to be 100 million songs on Spotify. And that is not just all the new songs that are going to be written, all the new bands that are going to be formed, but it's all the remixes and samples and derivative works that of user-generated content that are going to be brought online over this time. And so it turns out we don't actually have to solve this problem for the 30 million songs that go back into history. We just have to solve them for the 70 million songs that are going to happen in the future. And these things are free of, you know, free of all these attachments from the past. And the same applies to video. Every single minute, is it every single minute? 30, yeah, every single minute, 35 hours of video content are uploaded to YouTube. So in the next decade, we're talking about 130 million hours of video. You know, we can make a total break with the past because the past is going to look like a small minority of content in 10 years' time. And here's something else. It turns out that lots of the institutions that we would like to disrupt or replace are actually owned and controlled and run for the interests of songwriters, publishers, and artists. And those songwriters and artists are not happy with the status quo. And so, yes, we've already worked with an independent artist in Image and Heap. We're currently working on a joint project with an artist who has had two top 20 albums in the US. But we're also already working with all of the, not all of the, a large number of the big institutions in music, the people that really control things. And that's why, because the pressure from artists and writers is real. And it's not just about music, because music is a raw ingredient that is used in film, in TV, in games, in your vines. And so what we're talking about here is a totally new paradigm for content and all content creators. And I really believe that we are within touching distance of achieving that. So thank you very much. I don't have a very quick question while they work out if there's time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have time for one question. So this has um, come out of the consensus organization, which is an indeterminate number between 50 and something above that. Um, and I suppose, and the people that worked on the prototype was sort of a core group of about five, um, you know, back-end contract stuff, front-end development, graphic design, 
you know, me doing, waving my hands around, kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, how does Image and Heap feel about how it all went? I think one of the things that I find the most interesting about it is that having, come, having fully embraced this idea of transparency and full transparency, I think that it is quite a shock to suddenly have people be able to see how much of the income she is receiving. And that's just an interesting dynamic that um, we're having to explore. And it, but it's sort of what it proves is that if it's transparent, it has to be right. And so she's kind of really thinking hard. It's really making her think hard about what, should, what splits should artists get in the future, what splits should um, non-featured artists get, et cetera. Um, so that's interesting. Um, you'd have to ask Imogen the, <laughs> for her own view on it. Yeah. Thank you, Phil.